Hey, future respiratory therapists, welcome back. Hope everybody had a great week back to school. I know I did. I am uh, just got home from a wonderful day at clinic. We were in the ICU today. We had multiple interesting patients and something come up today that I want to talk about. But I've also received a question about this uh, from multiple people over just the last couple of weeks. And so we're going to do a video over this. And this is what is RSBI, how do we calculate it, what does it mean, what does it tell us, those type of things. Now, when you say RSBI, you have to understand that different facilities and different people refer to this in different manners. If you're talking to me, I simply say RSBI. If you talk to some people, they'll call it the RISB. Okay, that's RSBI sounded out and it's what's the patient's RISB. Some people refer to it as what's their frequency over tidal volume. And so you need to understand that all of those things are referring to the same um, thing, which is the RSBI, which stands for, and you have to understand what this stands for, because as students, you're like, man, this is another formula that I can't remember. Well, if you know what it stands for, then that's half the battle, just like everything else. When I tell you APRV, how does it function? Well, what do the words stand for? Airway, pressure, release, ventilation. So PAV, what does it stand for? Proportional Assist Ventilation. That's why you set a percentage of support and not a set pressure support. So always knowing what these acronyms mean will a lot of times tell you what it is you need to do. So let me break this down for you. So I told you it's, it's, it's Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. Okay, now the formula for this is that you take frequency and you divide it by tidal volume, but you have to make sure your tidal volume is in liters. Okay, so if your patient has a tidal volume of 400 mLs, then when you do this formula, you have to put it in liters, which is going to be 0.4 liters. So 400 milliliters is the same as 0.4 liters. So that's the first thing you need to know is what is the formula? Now, how do I remember this formula, Joe? Well, think about it. What does it stand for? Rapid, shallow. Rapid, shallow. The R, rapid, refers to frequency. The S, shallow, refers to the depth of each breath. So you have frequency over tidal volume. Okay, now... Since we know we've done that now, we know what the formula is and what it's talking about. Let me show you what it looks like. So this is the formula. If you have a patient breathing, I don't know, let's just say 22 times a minute with a tidal volume of, let's just go 400 mLs, then you turn that into 0.4 liters and you do the math. And we see what we get here. We get 22 divided by 0.4. And this patient has an RSBI of 55. That's it. The RSBI is 55. Now, what you need to remember about this is that the research revolved around rapid shallow breathing index says that a rapid shallow breathing index less than 105 is indicative of and supports positive outcomes with extubation. It doesn't mean that they're going to fly. It doesn't mean that the extubation is going to be successful. It's just another indicator that goes along with all of your other weaning parameters. Your MIP, your vital capacity, we're talking to RSBI, <clears throat> you have your can the patient raise their head up off the pillow all of those different things like i literally have worked with physicians who say put the patient on cpap five and five 30 minutes <clears throat> you give them all this data and they seriously look at you and go can the patient raise their head off the pillow and you go yeah because i asked them to yes and they go okay pull it do you care about anything else i told you about nope can they raise their head off the pillow maybe they may interrupt you Hey, doc, I got this SBT results. We want to see about extubating this patient. The RSBI, is, stop. Can I raise your head off the pillow? Yes, extubate him. All of those have shown to be 
positive indicators for weaning success, but none of them have shown absolute single most best indicator. So that's the first thing you need to understand about RSBI after you understand the formula, how to calculate it, and what numbers you need to be. You need to understand that this is not a, a full safe weaning parameter. It doesn't say, oh, I have, a, I have an RSBI of, of 90 or I have an RSBI of 20. It doesn't mean that your patient 100% will successfully extubate. It's just another tool on your tool belt to say, we got all of these positive indicators, let's move forward. Now, me personally, I don't even like to necessarily associate it with just extubation and just weaning parameters. If I have a patient in, in CPAP with pressure support ventilation and I'm taking care of them throughout the day, and I know we're not going to extubate them, I still monitor the RSBI because I want to know if I'm providing this patient with enough pressure support. In this case, I am. But what if we had this? What if we had a, rate of, a, a, a respiratory rate of 22? Let's take this up a little bit. Let's say a respiratory rate of 32, and we have a tidal volume of 310, which would be 0.31, right? So... We do 31, I'm sorry, 32 divided by 0.31, and we have an RSBI of 103. Now that's still less than 105, but this patient would be probably much less likely to extubate, depending on the other parameters, than somebody with an RSBI of 30 or 40. So in this case, do we want our patient breathing 32 times a minute with an RSBI, RSBI of 103? Probably not. Depending on what settings we're on, let's say this is on uh, you know, a pressure support of 8 with a CPAP of 5, maybe if we increase this pressure support to 10, no harm in doing so. We're not, about, we're not, we're not considering extubation at this point. What if it takes this tidal volume up to 360 and the rate goes down to 28? then we've lowered our RSBI and we've reduced the work of breathing from the patient's perspective. And that to me seems like a good thing, okay? So I always, anytime I have a patient in any spontaneous mode of ventilation, I always assess the RSBI to ask myself, are, are we, are we, where is this patient at and how are they breathing spontaneously, okay? So that's that. Now here's something else I wanna show you because I wanna show you a trick here. So I want to give you a little tip that can make this very, very easy for you. Of course, if you have to know the exact number, then you have to do the math, okay? But let me give you two examples, and I'm going to illustrate something for you here. We're going to have two examples, respiratory rate over tidal volume. The first example, the patient is breathing 22 times a minute, and their tidal volume is, let's just go with what we just did, 400. And the second patient is breathing 32 times a minute, and their tidal volumes are 290. Now, without doing any math, I can tell you which one of these patients has an RSBI less than 100. The cutoff is 105. But really, what's the difference in 100 and 105? When you really start playing with these numbers, you're talking about a few mLs difference. All right, so this is what the, the research establishes. A lot of facilities and physicians will have their own numbers. Like some may only extubate if the RSBI is less than 70 or less than 80 or less than 40. Who knows, right? So understand that when I say 105, I'm referring to the research revolving around RSBI. Now, just by looking at this, I can tell you that this patient here has a lower RSBI than this patient. This patient's RSBI is higher. And the reason I can do that, and this RSBI is greater than 100. So just by looking, I can say this one, greater than 100, this one, less than 100. And here's how. If you will take your respiratory rate and compare it to the first two numbers of your tidal volume, so 22 is less than 40, and that's gonna to equate to less than 100. 32 is greater than 29, 
and this will equate to greater than 100. Now, if we do the math here, we'll see what our answer is. 22 divided by 0.4 is 55. Compared to 32, 32 divided by 290, 0.290 equals 110. Now, how does that work? How did we know that before we got into it, right? You must have done this, all this math already, Joe, right? To know that that was going to be greater than 100. I didn't. Look, let me show you something, guys. If you have a rate of 24 and your tidal volume is 0 0.240, 0 0.24 goes into 24 exactly 100 times. So if you have 24 and your tidal volume is 360, then your RSBI is going to be less than 100. If you have 24 and your tidal volume is 190, then you're going to be greater than 100. Okay? All because whatever your rate is, your tidal volume in liters, point whatever, will go into it 100 times. When they're the same, you're at 100. When the rate is less than the first two numbers of your tidal volume, you're less than 100. Tidal volume, first two numbers, are less than your rate, you're greater than 100. That's a quick way to look at your patient from the door and say, oh, my RSBI is less than 100. And you can, you can quickly assess this without having to go in, pull out your calculator, and actually calculate it. It doesn't matter if this RSBI here <clears throat> is 107 or 117. It's greater than 100. You're probably not extubating this patient, and you're probably not offering this patient with enough support to make them comfortable. Same thing here. You look at this patient, and you go, okay. My RSBI is less than 100. They look comfortable. RSBI less than 100. We may can extubate this patient today. Okay? If they're the same, you go, eh, I'm right at 100 right now. We're at that line being really close to 105, and we need to see if, if, if this is a viable opportunity for extubation or not. Chances are it may be. It may not. It just depends. Okay? So... So that's, that's the trick that I wanted to show you with the RSBI. You can quickly assess it just by comparing your rate to the first two numbers of your spontaneous tidal volume. Don't ever calculate the RSBI when your patient is ACVC. It doesn't matter. You have a set tidal volume and a set rate, and it may vary based off of the patient initiating breaths, but your tidal volume is set. So your RSBI is not even relevant in this scenario. You're only calculating RSBI when you're assessing spontaneous rate to spontaneous tidal volume. So that's what you need to know. <clears throat> now, pretty much covered everything in terms of RSBI. So I'm going to give you a little scenario. You have a patient. The patient is on pressure support of 5 with a CPAP of 5. So this is 5 over 5. They have a MIP of negative 22. Their vital capacity is unable to be achieved because neurologically they can't follow directions to do a vital capacity. The only way you got a MIP of negative 22 is with an extended inspiratory hold and assessing the NIF based off a of neural drive debris. It wasn't, it wasn't because they sucked in hard for you. You had to wait two, three, four, five breaths and each one got larger and larger. They have an RSBI. I'm sorry, they don't have an RSBI. They have a spontaneous tidal volume of, uh, let's go 360. And they have a spontaneous rate of 24. Now the question is, what are you going to do? A, B, C, or D? Are we going to extubate? Are we going to return to previous settings? Are we going to increase pressure support? 
or are we going to deflate the cuff? Now, if you want to, you can pause this video and you can ask yourself, what am I going to do for this patient? This is the information you have. Your secretions are minimal. So minimal secretions, positive cuff leak, a MIP of minus 22, unable to get a vital capacity, tidal volume 360, respiratory rate of 24. What are you going to do? Pause this video, come back. I'm going to talk you through it, okay? So here we go. The first thing when assessing all of this is what answer can I eliminate right off the bat? And the answer to that is this dumb answer right here. <clears throat> there is no reason to deflate a cuff on a mechanically ventilated person. Okay, there's no reason. So, so you're not going to do that. Until you get ready to extubate, there's no need to deflate the cuff. That's, that's just the, there's always one answer that is completely wrong. And that's the completely wrong answer. Okay. Um, are you going to return to previous settings? Or are we going to increase pressure support? Or are we going to extubate this patient? Now, if this patient's problem has resolved, like I said it, like I indicated that it has, you're on minimal settings. You have an acceptable MIP. It's, it's more negative than negative 20. Even though it barely is, it's still more negative than negative 20. Tidal volume at 360, respiratory at 24. Secretions aren't a problem, and airway edema is not a problem because you have a positive cuff leak. Then what we should do here is ask ourselves, what's the RSBI? And when we do this, we do 24 divided by 0 0.360 equals 66. And for this patient, who you want to give an opportunity to fly, okay, if you will, if you take that word for it, if there was other problems, you may would consider increasing the pressure support. But in this case, with a good RSBI, good NIF, we're not going to increase pressure support. There's no need to return to previous settings. And we're probably going to extubate this patient. Okay? Now, if I change this to 240 and change this to 36 then we have a different scenario on our hands and this patient is not ready for extubation so here we would not extubate we would consider b or c depending on what information we had about the patient if you wanted to keep them in pressure support ventilation then increase the pressure support to get your tidal volume up your rate will go down your RSBI will improve, but they're not ready for extubation. If you work in a facility where you don't ventilate people and allow people to stay in pressure support CPAP or PSV ventilation, then you would say failed SBT and you would return to previous settings. Okay, so that's the breakdown of RSBI. I hope it makes sense. I hope I answered your questions. And I hope you go out and, and use this tool every chance you get. Okay? Best wishes.